Hello, hello, and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm Shamel Jordan, your host. My name is around here somewhere. There I am. Have you ever mocked someone for, you know, behavior and, and then you find yourself doing it yourself? You know, I've done that. I remember the first time I went down south to do research. This was my first genealogy research trip. And I swear, I felt like I stepped back to the 1800s because everybody talked about the Civil War, the Civil War, the War, the War. That's all I heard was about the Civil War. And I'm like, could they please come to this century? But while I was down there, thanks to Whit Rick Sayer, I learned how to map cemeteries. So you know what I did? I came back to Jersey and I mapped all the Civil War soldiers that are buried in Lawnside. There's like over 150 of them. And so what do I do now? The war, the war, the war. I just can't, I just love the Civil War because I feel, you know, that's when we could have really gotten it right after the Civil War. But when you're into the Civil War, you get to meet some amazing people. And one of those amazing people is on our show today, Walt. He's going to be our special guest. And he's going to talk about an untapped resource. If you have a Civil War ancestor, you want to learn about the GAR. And he's going to talk about garnering GAR ancestors. Well, recently, I've been drugged into the 20th century to do research on the Green Book. You know, if it wasn't for this, I would still be in the Underground Railroad in the Civil War time. But I'm so excited to be doing research where I can actually talk to people who were there. Um, and so what Michael and Jim have to talk about today, which is city directories, when they talk about you do need this appendix, the city directories are key to the research that I'm doing on the Green Book. I didn't tell you what the Green Book is. I think you might know this, but the Green Book was a travel guide for African-Americans, and it lasted from the 30s through the 1960s. And so the city directories are a great resource for that. So they're going to talk about that today. Hello and welcome, welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm so happy to have you here. And I want to know who you are. So we always asked whether you are watching the show live or in repeat, tell us where you are because we like to know where you are. And guess what? One day we might be near you and we'd like to see you and meet you. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the show. Bring out my buddies, my, they call themselves our, the regulars. They're regular, all right. They're not regular at all. First out, columnist and editor, Jim Beidler, <laughs> and author and blogger and just all around great guy, genealogy tip of the day, Michael John Neal. How are you guys doing? That, well, that was I just want to say, that's all I have to say. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I want to say being dubbed irregular by you is an honor I never expected to have. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys have Civil War ancestors? Oh, heck yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, the, the GAR is pretty cool. I've, I've, I got a chance to spend time there. Um, and so what's, can you, like, I forgot that I didn't tell you guys I was going to ask you this, but what's something really cool about that you've learned by having a Civil War ancestor doing research? What What's cool about doing that? Well, my, uh, the two, the two I know of off the top of my head who were Civil War ancestors, uh, both of them uh, died fairly, fairly soon uh, after the the conflict, and I believe had some wounds from the war, and you know it it uh, kind of uh, put the human toll of war uh, on to me. You know that both of these men, you know, dying in their fifties or sixties, um, you know, in their fifties, both of them, uh, you know, that says something to me. It gives me pause. 
Yeah, because it's so it's so personable. Personal. How about you, Michael? You. I would say there's, there's probably there's probably two things. If you get if you do a deep dive into the records, I've got a. He was a first cousin of a of my ancestor who he died when he was 23 and he was in a military hospital. And the hospital records indicate the treatments he was given. And they when I took those to a biology person that I knew, she said that just sounds painful. Um, that was just all. That was just you know um, the approach they were taking to his illness. It, it didn't succeed either, by the way. Um, and so that gave me a different perspective on medical care at that point in time. And if you look at pensions, if you've got a, a person who got a pension or the widow got a pension, aside from their military career, that can give you a tremendous amount of insight into what their life was actually like for most of the life after, after the war, which can give you a really good, a really good perspective. And that's separate from their war experience which is something you want to research but you want to research the other stuff too yeah that human toll i um you guys well there there was one medal of honor winner one of the people uh buried in lawnside um john henry lawson he got wounded and he refused to let them treat him because he said they were going to amputate him his, his one of his limbs and so he took care of himself but the medical, you know, in the in the pensions, they have that little body and they like mark it up if <laughs> mm -hmm. something. Yeah. So I had one where the arm, the guy's arm was like uh, amputated. So I thought that was cool. Those those little skulls. There was an uncle that was shot like three or four times in the back and they had all the marks of where he still had bullets. They had the, the bullet holes in, in him because I don't think he had. They were in places that they were okay to leave, and they weren't life threatening, and they showed where the bullets were still lodged in his body thirty years later. Wow! See, I've dr I've drugged you guys into the well. I'm sorry. I'm oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, and you know, a cool a cool Pennsylvania thing. If if uh, these folks were from the Pennsylvania Volunteers, uh, they compiled a history after the war of every company that was in the Pennsylvania Volunteers day by day, what their service was. What? And, and of course, interesting, yeah, by Samuel Bates, the hist five volumes of the history of the Pennsylvania Volunteers. And of course, it's interesting if you compare those versus what the Volunteers pensions say. Oh, sometimes they match and sometimes <laughs> they don't, you know, the guy, the guy who, who says that, you know, you know, he was, uh, you know, ha having to roll out under fire and all this, you find out he was guarding a railroad in the back of the lines. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. There's some interesting things in those pensions, but guess what? We have a nice group of people here. Paula, hello from West Defer. Paula's like always our number one. I don't know what happened to Gary Franklin. Hello, Paula. <laughs> Jenny um, from sunny Lincoln, Nebraska, 78 degrees. Wow. Hello, Deborah Ruth from Maryland. Dean Henry from the Philly Burbs here live. Hello, Dean. Hello, Marianne from the coast of North Carolina. I love North Carolina. Hello, Chris from Lynn, Massachusetts. We have um, Sakina Martin checking in from Delaware. Hello, Delaware. And we have Donna from Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh is like my dream space outside of Washington, D.C. and Utah. Hello, Susan from Reading, PA. Is that Pennsylvania or is that bordering Pennsylvania? No, that's like, that's, well, she, she, if she's really in Reading, that's that's a little, little bit... Um, shall we say less pencil tucky than where I'm at, but I was going to say, you probably better be careful. You've already said Pennsylvania was cool, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around. <laughs> hey, June two from Indianapolis. I heard you guys don't like Indy. I love seeing Indy. Hello. Um, <laughs> hello. Um, is this cat jazz? Is this Katie? Katie, Katie, you're in trouble for doing this to me twice. Denise Payne in the middle of the night. How are you from the Netherlands? And um, did I say hi to Marianne again? Yes. Hello. I'm so glad you're here. And Jean from AAGG Collegeville. And uh, 
you have a copy of the green book. Very nice. Very nice. They actually put all of the volumes together in a book. I'm going to have to have somebody come on and do a quick start that includes the green book. Hello, MW from Philly. Philly is in the house multiple times. We are so happy to have you here. So let's go ahead and get started with this quick start, which is, I'm going to try not to get sidetracked on this one. You do need this appendix. What is this all about, guys? <laughs> well, well, it's, 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 it's a not about surgery. <laughs> it's a misconception that doctors have about, no, about your appendix, no. Um, we're going to talk, we're not going to talk about where your ancestor's name appears in the legitimate directory with the address and that information. That's good information, but that's not our focus. We're going to talk about the things that may be in the front, but most of the time this stuff is in the back, the errata, miscellaneous things. Some of it's pretty typical. Some of it is atypical. It just depends on the eccentricities of the compiler, what you might find in the back of, of a, a city or a county directory, you want to take a look because you don't know until you look and so it can be very unstandard from one to the other what different things are in the back. Yeah, I just run to my people and I'm like, okay, got them. All right, I'm out of here. Especially yeah. when you have to do like decades of, of city directories. One last question. Did they stop doing city directories when they started doing telephone books? Oh, in, I think in the very largest cities they did, uh, because it could, cause I, I've heard it said of Philly that uh, pretty much the last completely citywide city directories are in the 30s, uh, and the yeah, phone books kind of take their their place. Uh, smaller cities like Reading, where I near where I live, uh, you know, you you had them uh, considerably later. Uh, Cause I remember when I was, when I was a little cub in the, in the, the copy, the copy room uh, that uh, there were city directors and this was 1978, 79. Oh, wow. uh, there were still city directors for Reading that we were using. We were using the crisscross, which we're going to talk about, uh, you know, like, Oh, what's, you know, when, when we'd hear something on the police radio to try to think, okay, who, you know, who's, who possibly might be uh, living near there. Very cool. All right, let's move to step one of you do need this appendix. Choose a location and a year. So city directories, they say we think it needs to be a city. Is that true? Uh, in most cases, uh, you know, th there, are, there are certainly more for uh, incorporated cities than there are for larger areas but there are some county directories or some rural directories uh, you know one, one that i i famously think of uh from schuylkill county pennsylvania that is a county-wide directory of 1890 and of course why might that be important because it <laughs> makes up it makes up for the the no longer in existence 1890 U.S. Census. Great census um, substitute there. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I would say the main difference between rural versus urban directories, urban directories are typically, and even larger towns, they're every year, whereas in rural areas, it's not nearly that, that frequent. The other thing you want to keep in mind is uh, an urban area might include, or a semi-urban area, uh, if you will, might include some outlying towns in that directory that you might not think about as being in there. So if your people are like a few miles from a larger town, look and see if that larger town has a directory and does it include that outlying that outlying area? Well, it, yeah, because it might it might include all some sub, what we'd now call suburban areas that. Well, the example is Reading near where I live. A lot of the suburban post offices, you can either use Reading or Why I'm Missing or Sinking Spring, and it and it gets there. So in the in the Reading City Directory, it may include those close in burbs. And how early are they? Are there city directories from the? Are they mostly um, a nineteenth century? It's a nineteenth century. Twentieth century. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have you have you have just a few from Philadelphia in the 18th century, uh, just a couple, uh, and then 
you know, very major cities in the first half of the 1800s, uh, but then it becomes a whole lot more co common the second half of the 1800s. All right. I'm glad I got my questions out. You guys have questions for them? Make sure you put them in the chat because it's not all about me, even though I forget that sometimes. Oh, come on. Right. It's a, it, it, it's always about you, Shamel. <laughs> So we've chosen a location, we've chosen a year to begin with. And so let's move on to step two, which is to locate the city directory. So where do we find city directories? You can, some of them are online at ancestry.com if you have a subscription to that. The other places to look are on uh, book, Google Books, books.google.com. You may find some digitized ones there that are out of copyright. Um, archive.org also has significant numbers Ooh. of uh, city directories um, that are digitized online. And the thing about archive.org is if it's on archive.org, normally you can download a PDF of the whole of the whole thing. So that would be a, those would be some places to start. You could also just do a Google search. Um, but if we're talking about ones that are online first, and again, those are things that are typically out of copyright, those would be the places uh, to look family search generally speaking there may be a few in family search but that was never family search's goal of one of the things they collected was okay. not city directories that just wasn't in their mission statement um, if you will for what they collected and because they are published items you generally won't find them in state archives you'll find them in state libraries because uh, mm -hmm. like the Pennsylvania State Library has uh, an excellent collection of, uh, of city directories, uh, most of them on, on microfilm. Uh, in, in Philadelphia, you've got, you've got a lot at Historical Society of Pennsylvania and likewise at the Free Library of Philadelphia are the, are the major repositories for, uh, uh, for, for the offline city directories. Yeah, they have them at the Camden County Library. And so it, you guys the, check them out. You know, the city, the city library's website may have a genealogy page, a research page, an archives page, whatever they call it, that will have information about directories and potentially where you can which ones they have in their collection and where you can access some of those, some of those online. That would be another resource guide you might want to. All right, so we found area. them online. We found them at our at a repository, a library. And so that takes us to step three, which is to browse the inventory. So are you talking about the inventory that, of availability? I'm starting to think we meant table of contents there. I think that's inventory. the next step. So, oh, is it? So getting a list of what they have. What and they I have, think, yeah. There we I've, go. Now yeah, we, we well, it, it's so it's what different repositories gotcha. or different online sites have as far as numbers. I just confused that. Yeah, <laughs> we did this. It was just last week that we put this together. Come on now, um, but yeah, because because it's it's rare. It's rare, unfortunately, that any one online source has a complete run. Oh, and, and, yeah, and that's what that's what we meant. Yeah. Particularly and, that that one website that shall not be named that requires an annual fee. Um, they may suggest they have ancestry. They may suggest they have a run of a hundred years of them. And yeah, they may have a hundred. Well, beginning to end is a hundred year coverage, but there may be significant gaps in the end. Yeah. So you want to make certain what they, they have. They, what they, they have, have 1870 and 1970 and nothing in between. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the same frustration as newspaper uh, exactly. subscription databases where it's like, oh, great. They have my hometown newspaper. And then it's 1862 to 1864. <laughs> so, uh, but but th this is this is something you got to do as far part of your research is, um, you know, not just rely on <coughs> Ancestry or archive.org uh, or, what, or whatever. You've got to also, uh, you've got to look at all the all the different sites and realize they're, they're even for smallish cities or medium cities at least, a lot of times it, there wasn't just one being published. This oh, was a com competitive a thing. Yeah. So with a telephone directory, normally there's just one. Are you saying that there could be multiple 
city directories for the same yes. year? Yes, yeah. because, because these were for-profit enterprises oh, that no, that no. Re relied on sales, whereas for for most of the time, uh, the telephone the telephone companies were monopolies, and so that until deregulation. Boy, I'm dating myself here because a lot of people <laughs> probably have only lived during deregulation, but uh, during the Ma Bell era, so to say, uh, you know, yeah, there was one, there was one phone book, uh, but these C directories, the, these were, as far as I know, never municipal creations. Oh. They were private publishers, and you know, they were competitive. You know, hey, we got, you know, we, we got, got the, the best we got stuff, the, the, right? The most accurate data, or the yeah. best errata, yeah. or the yeah, <laughs> um, we have, we use a better alphabet. Okay, so um, we know what we're looking at, what we have, what's in the inventory. Now we want to go to step four, which is to review the table of contents. So yeah, yeah. just to this just is, to see what it contains besides the alphabetical list of names. Not saying we're not saying you shouldn't look at that because you should, but you want to get beyond that. Right. This is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, where 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 you're going to go beyond just plopping a surname into a search box and and seeing, you know, yeah, they're there. No, they're not there, but going further than that. So let's see some of this wonderful stuff that you um, guys have shared um, from that table of contents. And is it going to show? Maybe. There we go. So what is this? Well, names too late. <laughs> it pretty much, they either didn't give the information for one reason or another. They got left out of the original uh, set of pages of, of names, and it isn't like today where they could just put it in there with the computer. This is you know 1863, so they just dump these names in an appendix. So this is one of the first things you want to look and see if there is an appendix for of people that got left out of the main body of the directory for whatever reason. All right. So if you don't see them, check this out. I love yeah. them. And I'm, cause I'm always suspicious. Uh, you know, obviously this should be stuff that is searchable, uh, but it may, it may or may not be. Uh, and this, this leads to a pretty, pretty good tip that once you think about it is obvious, but a lot of people don't think about, it. you know, that was showing 1863 directory. Well, understand the directory dated 1863 was compiled in 1862. Ah, so okay. always realize there's usually at least a year's lag time in things except for like that errata. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and even that would have had some lag time because, yeah, we're dealing with hot, hot type printing technology. Love it. Love it. Make sure that, yeah, that's so smart. You're so smart. You're not irregular. You're irregular in your genius. <laughs> All right. What's this? What's this here? Um, this, this is also, we kind of picked 1863 as a year for a lot of these things. This was a, a, just a, a directory of Davenport, Iowa churches. There's a little bit of history there. The names of the of the pastor. It's even got what time services were at. If you're interested in that, not that you're going to attend in 1853 <laughs> unless you got time travel, but it, I thought it was kind of cool. They had different, just like today, different times in the winter and the summer for when they had service. This is just a little background information. If you didn't, if you didn't have it as well, it's they also got the name of the day. pastor or the priest, you know, so this is a place where if you've got a marriage record and you can kind of read the name of the minister, but you can't quite make it out for sure. Oh. You could look at a, a directory and see if you can find any, if they got married in Davenport, Iowa, for example, you could look and see, are there any names that are close to that one that you think you can read, but you can't quite uh, make out like the Reverend J A M. Hella. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> Hella Magor, something like that. Um, that would help me. Then it would tell me, Oh yeah, they must've got married in St. Anthony's Catholic church. And I could go from, go from there. It's even got the, where the buildings were at at that point in time, which could be somewhere different from today, if they're even in existence. Today. They're bragging yeah. about membership too. Yeah, yeah which can are. which can show you, you know, if you know where they resided, it can be suggestive of where they might have worshipped the the local church, and these ministers' names may lead you to private pastoral registers. That you know, especially in 
in uh, uh, denominations that didn't always keep good congregational records mm -hmm. that you have a backup way of trying to find uh, uh, vital record substitutes on the family. One last thought about this, and we'll go to the next slide. It would also, in a city that had a lot of Catholic churches, for example, looking at the last surname of the priest could give you a clue as to what ethnicity tended to attend that um Mm. Oh, oh yeah. Whether that's going to be a guess, but you know, I could give you a. a I'll try this first because there was a German guy here, and there it looked like that was an Irish name or whatever else. I'm going to go to that next and not try that. Well, because because um, because some of them may be ethnic parishes exactly. instead yeah. of geographic parishes in the Catholic Church. Brilliant. Yeah, Sheila talked about that when she talked about the uh, church records. Fantastic. Um, did the churches have to pay to be in here? I really doubt No, I doubt it. No. Okay. The advertisements would have had to have paid. And while you're pulling up the next slide, we can address Susan's question of how to search the business ads. The business ads, you could page by page is, the, is probably going to be the way to go. Sometimes there will be an index of advertisers. We're not going to talk about that when we talk about the errata, but in the back, there may be an index to advertisers. Um, you could also put in the names of the businessmen and see if they come up with a full text search as, as well. Those would be two, uh, two options for that. Great. Sometimes Thanks. you can't cheat, Susan. Uh, it may, you may just have to do a page by page search, unfortunately. Uh, but I would look for an index of advertisers. This is a street directory, not quite a crisscross directory, but it uh, it gives you an idea. This was from 1895 of where these streets ran. I think those are house numbers there, um, perhaps, uh, to kind of give you an idea. But Pearl Street, north from the river to Summit, east of State, gives you an idea of where it's at. And then these are the cross streets. I'm oh. assuming those are the uh, numbers there for those. The, ra the range of the house numbers exactly. on those other streets, yeah. Very cool. And I oh think if God. I recall in this one, there was no actual map. Would have been nice if they could have drawn a picture. But there was no actual <laughs> map. This was uh, in some kind of in gazetteer format, if you will, was how the geographic information was being uh, was being provided was in this street uh, street directory. So you guys keep talking about a crisscross. Can you tell us what a crisscross is? We have two minutes. <laughs> crisscross is where where it takes street by street and lists who was living there. Oh. So in in other words, in in if you if you um, you know find your ancestor there at four seventy one Chestnut Street and you want to know who their neighbors are, you go to the crisscross. And there you get 469, 473, and so forth. Wow. I'm yeah. missing so Powerful much. Tool. It I organizes just the, my people. What were you going to yeah. say? It organizes the people geographically instead of alphabetically. But keep in mind, not every directory has that crisscross right. in the back okay. of it. Yeah. Let's see. Did you have something else? Yes, let's show this. We've got what two more real. This? This, there's two more from a rural directory. Uh, 1918 Hancock County, Indiana. These are the different breeds of chickens that were being raised by <laughs> uh, the farmers that were in the in the directory there. And uh, Leghorns were the only ones I'd heard of. The others were I'd heard of a bantam rooster, but um, this was just part of it. There were more breeds of chickens than I ever. My are these the sellers or are they nice, just, but, who are these people? Are they the, the farmer farmers? The, these are the farmers that were in the directory. And then you could also indicate in this, in this one, this series of directories from the 19, 18, 17 era, there's livestock directories in the back of it. I just picked on the chickens. There's cattle, <laughs> there's pigs, there's sheep. There was one where I saw somebody was raising cats. And I, I just what? thought I was dreaming, but it was there. I should have sent you that one. It was cats. And I thought, you got to be kidding. I'm okay me. that you didn't send that. Oh, tractor that's, that's owner's good. directory. I love this, these rural ones. You get all this. This cool is stuff. an era where we're talking 1918. So tractors were not super common in 1918. They were very pricey. Um, and so this was a direct. If, or, you know, maybe if I'm thinking the, the model was there. So if I want to buy a Fordson, which was actually made by Ford Motor Company. 
Um, there's a whole story to that that we're not going to go into. If I was thinking of buying a Fordson, well, I'm over Mr. Glover over there, he's got a Fordson. Maybe I'll go down and see what he thinks of it. Should I get one or, if, you know, whatever. Um, you could kind of get a feel for how they were running talking to somebody else. Um, they also had a car directory, too, which I didn't give a screenshot of that. Um, as well. So Susan says that the Akron, Ohio city directory followed her grandfather's arrival with his first wife, showed their son and where he worked and when he joined the army and later married the presence of his second wife. And finally, after he, he died, his wife until she died. The whole family chronology. That's I great, mean, Susan. Right. amazing yeah. you, that's yeah. amazing just, yeah if you just go year by year if you're lucky enough it's a place that has one every year then you can find quite a bit out just by tracing them through every year in the in the directories that's a real that's good example fantastic so this that was step four look at the table of contents then view what's in there and then step five is to oh, we browsed it we browsed the city directory we, we so browsed, don't browsed, just search it, it go page by page right so let's go and look at the steps for you do need this appendix step one is choose a location in a year step two is to locate the city directories at the library online archives.org uh, i'm going to internet archives for sure um step three is to browse the inventory what is available which years are available step four review the table of contents and step five is to browse the city directory man that was great do you think that they're going to find out one day that our appendix is really important in our bodies i just believe that that, that they're going to somebody's going to be laughing at us 50 years from now only if the little parts inside are alphabetical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're irregular again. See you. All right, guys, let's get ready for our second quick start. Give me one second. All right, like I told you, when you research the Civil War, you meet some amazing people, amazing people. And today I'm going to share with you one of the amazing people that I've met. And I'm just going to be around him all the time because I learn so much. Everyone, please say hello to our special guest, Walt Lafty. Hello, Walt. Hello, Shamal. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, those two guys were interesting. Uh, don't, 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 no, don't, let's not talk about, I've had enough of them. No, okay. just kidding. <laughs> they are interesting. That's why I love having them on this show. So, well, I always ask the genealogist, you know, when did you get the bug? When did you get, what's your one minute story? So you're a civil war researcher. You're in the sons of union veterans. Mm -hmm. When did you get started and how did you know that you were hooked? Well, I've been doing genealogy probably since 1984, my brother and I, and we were so focused on our surname side for many, 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 many years. And then um, it was after about 10 or 15 years, we started on our mother's side. And that's where we made the first connection to the Civil War. Ultimately, we're able to prove three direct uh, great great grandfathers that served in the in the American Civil War, and from that point on, um, I, I just went went crazy with it. Uh, I've I've always had somewhat of an interest in the Civil War since I was a kid, but just you know raising kids and working and other activities just didn't have the time to put into that. But once I found that connection. Uh, that just uh, propelled me into the Civil War community. So I've only been in the Civil War community now probably about 15 years, but have gotten very, very active in it. And it's just been exciting. You, He's more than active. You should see how he runs around. He finds all this stuff. If you want to find some stuff, you come hang out with Walt. So Walt, we're going to do this um, great quick start. Mm -hmm. And it is called... Um, thanks to our regulars, garnering GAR ancestors. And GAR stands for the Grand Army of the Republic, right, Walt? Correct. Correct. So let's take a look at step one. 
Step one is to identify a Civil War veteran. I originally said soldier, but we have all those sailors. Mm -hmm. Were any of yours were all soldiers, Walt? All soldiers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot sailors, of sailors in other other wars, uh, you know, World War One and so on. But no, Civil War, they were all soldiers. All right. So you want to identify a Civil War veteran. Mm -hmm. And then step two is to do general oh i want to say one thing like i always encourage people who might not have a um story a family story that says that they have civil war ancestors to search the pension index records that you can get on ancestry is that what you suggest people do a good way to see if you yeah, have actually war? exactly and let's listen to to jim and mike uh they're all the resources that uh really are going to uh uh, sort of get you the information that you really need. And I listened to those guys talking about, you know, the medical records, the, the pension the records, mm -hmm. certainly from a genealogical standpoint, especially you're, you're going to get more information, especially if it's the widow. Yeah. Uh, that's how I ultimately made my direct uh, uh, contact to where in Ireland my family was from. The ancestors records did not say that. Right. But his one sister, when her husband died, uh, uh, and she she sent for her pension records, she had to produce so much more. She had to she had to verify where she was married, and it listed the priest and the town and the parish that they were married in. So for years, all I knew about her brother, who was my direct ancestor, was Ireland. So, so, so valuable, valuable. So record. everyone who has an ancestor who could have been of age search the pendex, pension index cards on Ancestry and see if you might have had one. Fold three, yeah. So fold let's three, move, yes. oh, fold three too. Let me not leave out fold three. Step two is to do general genealogical research, which kind of Walt was talking about. And you have an amazing example of, so when we say do general research, we're talking about census and vital records. And let me show what you found that was just amazing. Just a basic um, census record. Tell us about the census record here. Yeah, now what, what's fascinating for this example for me is that this one came to us as a research, uh, requesting research help, not through the Civil War. The person, I believe it was this one. I had, I've had two or three over the over the years, where the people didn't know anything about the Civil War they found a census record or some other or some other item that identified their ancestor as a civil war veteran in this case this fellow did not know all he found was his he was looking for the woman on here anna and he finds anna and if you look there at the top the address gar home for veterans for the and you know and their wives and wow it was like had no idea that he had an ancestor in the Civil War. So he searched around for the GAR home. It eventually led him to us. Um, I, I picked up on the research from that. And then that ultimately led, led us to getting the records. We do have about 14 boxes of records. For Hold on, Walt. Well, don't go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> so so really just getting those, see, Walt's excited. Like, that's why I love hanging out with Walt. He's yeah. just like, let's go, let's go. Kind of slow me so down. Really, you are um, just checking what you have and doing the basic research to see if that leads you to a Civil War ancestor. And so step three is then to contact you, contact the GAR. Right. So Walt, um, you work where? In Northeast Philadelphia is where we are. We just moved to a new location. We just opened a up. A beautiful location. It is, yeah. Very historic building. It was uh, built in 1805. It's on the historic register. We moved from a building that we had been in from the 1950s. Uh, it originally uh, moved there from a Grand Army post, post number two, which is where we got most of our artifacts. Ultimately came to us. Uh, came to that building 
and then ultimately turned into a museum. So we just moved. There's the address there, 8110 Frankfurt Avenue. It's in the northeast section of Philadelphia. And do what you have, is it primarily Philadelphia? And I think you said you had some South Jersey post as well in there. No, no, no. I, my, uh, when I mentioned South Jersey, that was one of my direct ancestors. His post records are in the Salem County Historical Society. We don't have any post for New Jersey, but we do have, um, I think, probably a, roughly about 40 different post records. Most are Philadelphia, maybe about eight or nine from other parts of the state. Uh, just did some research from Montague Hill of Pennsylvania. Um, we got one from Florida, one from Indiana, one from Montana, one from Missouri. <laughs> and I heard there's a woman on here from Massachusetts. I, I yes, believe I heard you. Okay. We have one post record, uh, post 32, I believe, off the top of my head. Um, I have it on the list. but um, And what it is is a list of some of their members who were buried in Maine. I don't know the rhyme or reason why that is, but it's their post records. Um, so we do have uh, we do have some scattered uh, some scattered records. Uh, so well, let's say they're not in Philly and their people were not in Philly. How do they figure out which where to where the GAR is? Great question. And one of the one of for their ancestor you're talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. Shamel, we 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 constantly get requests. Uh someone will email us and it'll be from Illinois or wherever. And I'll generally know off the top of my head we don't we don't uh, we don't have those. But there is a site, the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. I happen to be a member of uh Baker Fisher Camp 101 here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we meet in Hatboro. <clears throat> this is a website here. See that link at the very top with the uh, with the URL. Um, I try when I when I send requests out to people, cut and paste that with directions on how to get to exactly it. Because if you go to the main website, you're you're going to get to it, but it's not as friendly user as as I would like to say it. And there's like four or five steps. But what I'll do is click on, yeah, there it is there. So you, you want to start on, here, right? right projects, projects and preservation. preservation. You would click on it. It would take you to, uh, you, you would go down a little, little further down there. Grand Army, up, up a little. Grand Army to Republic uh, Records Project. It's the second bullet down. There and, we go. And, right. And that's going to take you um to here, see what I mean? It's hard to get to. Then you got to click on in the middle, GAR post by state. I actually have it on the second slide of the, it's going to take you to this map. Um, my link takes you right to the map. You got to, you can skip all those other places. So you click on the, the, the state in question. If you click on that, then you go to the top right hand side, GAR records catalog, and it's going to show now that, that one there. I can already see, see all the blanks under location. Yeah. And pick, pick Pennsylvania or another state. There are a couple states that just do not have any records. Illinois is going to have some. Now. You can see the see, post number. You go down here. numerically. Now you can't, you can't do a search. You can't do a find on here on this site itself, but you can use your own computer find do a word search. So in other words, let's say since you're in Illinois, Let's say you wanted to look up Chicago, you know, you could you could type in the word Chicago and it'll give you as many hits. And then you go down right where your cursor's yes, there, right Chicago. there. Right. You go to the right and it's going to show you the repository here, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Oh. Holds the following records. Okay. okay. So typically, Shamel, what will happen is when I get a request. And I don't, I don't, I know that we don't have it, or I look and find out we don't have it. I'm able to send this link and say, look, we, we, we don't, we don't have the records here. But if you contact the University of Chicago or wh this wherever the repository is, a lot of times they're not sure. And a lot of times I can't determine. I do try to make an effort. So here as an example, and I'll use some of the sites that Jim and Mike were talking about earlier. Uh, quite a few of them. 
let's say you send me a request for your ancestor and you don't know if he was in the GAR, uh, but you have, you, you know, when he died, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to go to newspaper, you know, dot com or some, a site like that. I'm going to try to get an obituary because typically um, uh, they, they may, men, may, may, may mention, may make mention of the post that he was in, mm -hmm. in his obituary as they would today, you know, uh, so-and-so died, they were a member of whatever. Um, so from that, I can then look and see, hey, do they have, uh, do they have any records? Okay. But if I can't find the person, I can only spend so much time doing the research. I will make an effort to try to connect this person, but there have been situations I just can't make the connection. So what I can do is send them that link and they're just going to have to, uh, uh, I try to do a little more digging themselves and maybe check the two or three posts that were in that town um, and see, you know, if there were records available. But I I usually make an effort and I don't know, I'm probably batting about 333, which <laughs> bad considering that was, uh, I believe, uh, oh, it was damn usual or one of those baseball players. That I <laughs> Anyway, there there are there are and there are other sources for records. That's just the main one that I will use and recommend. But there are various um, um, state sites that will sometimes have uh, genealogical information. No, that's fantastic. Just the set of that spreadsheet is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That you guide that they extremely did. useful. Extremely it's very useful. nice. And so that's, you want to contact the GAR and you get Walt and he tells you all his great information. And then what you want to do is you want to research the GAR records. So what types of records are available at the GAR? And that's, that's something we don't have the kind of records that Jim and Mike were talking about that re really will get you the, you know, the, the most information, again, the pension records, medical records, uh, military information, you really want those for your ancestors. But, uh, you know, if you do make a connection to the Civil War, um, there's a, you have a good chance that, that the person may have been a member of the GAR and that can provide some information. And if that GAR home one that we looked at previously, uh, that that was atypical of, of the records. Usually it'll have some information in there, but that one was a gold mine for the, for the fellow I was doing the research for, because it not only showed the, the ancestors, uh, uh, unit and when he served and it gave his pension certificate number, it gave where he was born. It gave his wife where she was born because she was living in the home with him. And again, the, the requester, wasn't looking for the Civil War veteran. He was looking for the wife. That's who he was connected. That's who he was looking for. So if that's atypical, what are some typical types of records? Well, that I just mean that it would be to. less. It would have less. His his just happened to have an abundance of information. And GAR post records are like that. Sometimes, like if, uh, let's say that uh, Mike and Jim and you and I all belong to the one post and you're uh, maybe two or three of them would have some basic information in our application, just our regiment, maybe our age, maybe when we enlisted, that's in. Other ones, other posts, whoever was recording it uh, just was, I don't know whether they had OCD or whatever. <laughs> we love the people with OCD. Yeah. 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 They filled out a, a, you know, a dissertation on the guy, which for, for those of us doing genealogies, it's, it's terrific, you know, that's and that's fantastic. all I meant by that. It's, it's okay. more typical that there'll be some information, but it won't be as abundant as it was for this uh, GAR post record. So let's take a look at this home GAR home records. I cannot believe um, whoever this is, they are the luckiest people in the world. So these, this is, these are records from that GAR home that we saw Correct. in the census records. Correct. And all of these pages in the red contain stuff about the Gillens, right? Was it right. the Gillen family? Uh, yes. And so Michael let's take a look at some of work. these. I actually, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I actually pulled, um, made those bigger. And so 
this was, it was it's like a diary. Um, tell yeah, me about here's, this. Here's one page. It's it's completely about them. Now, typically, what you would see is on a page like this up there, that top arrow. You might only see the person's name, the day would excuse me, the day he was admitted, and and maybe one or two more lines of information. This particular uh, record from 1917 was just extensive. And this whole page here is, is about both he at the top and Anna, uh, his wife, at the bottom. It so, says where they were born. Wilmington, Delaware, exactly. Where he was a private. The first Delaware volunteer. Oops. My thing is sensitive. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a whole page just on on this family, right? Where she's where they're buried. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So this you can see if, if you really glean some uh, some good genealogical information on yes. your family. And so this next section is hilarious. It's the daily record of the homes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that Mr. Gillen here uh, was probably uh, uh, a little so bit of a troublemaker there. Comrade, was confined to his room. Yeah. A little bit. Oh, he was a little better. So the next time he was a little better. <laughs> yeah. He's sick again and confined to his room. Oh, and then he's able to come downstairs and have some meals. meals. I like that. But he caused a lot of trouble <laughs> in the dining room. <laughs> I and, wish I knew what he was doing. Yeah. Well, she eventually leaves. His yeah, wife. Yeah, that one's in the next one. It's in the next one. So he must have uh, been an ornery, uh, an ornery uh, person. What's interesting about this? We just did some research recently on the woman who was the was the forerunner of establishing in this home, a woman who was a doctor in her time uh, in the eighteen seventies and eighty. Julia okay. Shea, uh, uh, she wanted to have this home because she really believed, as did the women that she worked with uh, or 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 was involved with, in the ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic and the daughters of Union veterans of the Civil War. She was a very active woman, Julia Shade. She just couldn't envision a soldier being separated from his spouse in their senior years. And I look at every time I think of this Gillen case here, I think, well, they went in for the right reasons. You know, she wanted to see them together. But I guess Anne had enough of Michael's uh, <laughs> shenanigans because she eventually leaves and she went to live with a niece. Oh, so she left him before she he left. died. She just a minute. Out. Yeah, she left before he died. Oh, let's look at that. Yeah. So started another. Oh, he was still acting up. Yeah, he was still acting up. And then uh, somewhere. Oh, in he here, threatened a comrade. Yeah. So he was an ornery old bird. And so I think the next one is when she talks about going to be with her niece. Oh, here we go. And she did. And I was able to track her living with her niece. <clears throat> oh, and it says exactly the where the niece is living. Yeah, 2200 North 27th Street. Wow. And I was able to track her later uh, in the census record. She said, I'm out of here. <laughs> did, she, did she divorce him? I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I only can go so far. I get caught up in it sometimes, but uh, <laughs> I have to remember, uh, I can't, like, we're not in a position to really do gene genealogy for people. We will try the best we can. It's really supposed to be GAR. Uh, sure, records. sure. Uh, but I can't help myself in trying to make that connection. <laughs> sometimes we don't find them in the GAR, but we'll find some substantial military records that the requester may have not had or had some of, and I'm able to find the we, we, the people that help me with it, we, we will find uh, some additional information. And I just love being able to pass that on to people. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot. It's rewarding. I can tell you enjoy it. So that's step four. Let's move on to step five, 
which is to research the encampment books. And that's, I have encampment books. <laughs> I, I love these. They're really nice. So talk to us about what encampment books are. So the encampments are to maybe put it into uh, today's uh, language, uh, like a kind of conference. Like you guys were talking about going to uh, this, uh, whatever you're going to, the conference coming up. But uh, like, like a work conference every, every year, say, uh, or a training uh, every year. Back in, in that, that time period, the Grand Army of the Republic, which those are not familiar with it, it's pretty much like today's VFW, American Legion, and so on. But the Grand Army of the Republic, they always had department encampments, which are statewide. That's your state organization. So we, we are the Pennsylvania Department. Um, and then uh, they would have an annual department and that, or an annual encampment, I'm sorry. So there are two different records. But the, the state ones, some states, Pennsylvania definitely was one, that every year during the encampment, when they recorded their uh, business, whatever was, was uh, business was conducted at the encampment, starting in 1898, now, the JAR was formed in 1866, but it wasn't until about 1898 that they decided to uh, include at the end, the next year, the members, the comrades who died the previous year. So how this can be helpful is if you have an ancestor who died, you know that they, all you know is that my ancestor, Joe Schmo, was a private in the 101st Pennsylvania. And you know that he died on such and such a date, but that's all you have. And the obituary doesn't shed any information. It doesn't say he was a member of the GAR or whatever. What you can do if you happen to, if, if it happens to be in one of these years where we have the records, what you can do is go to uh, the year after he died, look at the end. There's a memorial roll, all the comrades that died. They're in alphabetical order, and it will list their date of death from the previous year, it will list the post number that they belong to. That's what we're looking for. And here's an example, William Vautier. Um, and when first looking at this, he, if, if you don't have the obituary saying that he's a GAR member, this is just another resource that you can connect them to the GAR. Yeah. Once we did that, as soon as I saw it was post 71, I knew off the top of my head, I didn't have to look at the list. I knew we had those records at the GAR museum. Um, wow. And then we were able to look into and get the records. And so then, yeah, these encampment books are chock full of information. The first person I heard from them about them was from Tim Pinnock. And he said, you gotta look at these encampment books. Oh, exactly. And the good thing about it is they're digitized. And I heard, uh, I believe it might have been Michael or could have been Jim, one of those guys mentioned uh, like uh, archives.org and uh, Haiti Trust is another one. Oh. The encampment records have been digitized. <gasps> they don't have all states. There are okay. maybe only about 12 states and not all the states have the the amount of records that we have but pennsylvania's records you don't have to come to the jar museum to look them up no we're coming Go to right see and, look them up. Coming to and see that's you. another link i send to people if, if i'm if, if i'm you know i try to include as many links as i can to give them as a suggested suggestion to look and uh they're just terrific and you can do a word search a great word search in those digitized ones. Oh, I'm all over. I might not see you for a little while, Walt. You shouldn't have told me that. You should not have told me that. Yeah. They're, so they're one valuable. thing I missed, Walt, was um, you had post record that I wanted to show um, from JR Post that, 71. When that's what happened here. We were able to identify that this guy, William Vautier, if I'm pronouncing his name right, um, that... Um, once we got, once we were able to connect him from his date of death to uh, through the encampment records, and then here's an example of of a post record. So this would have been on his application. This is not. There are different types of records. This is called the the application. We don't have all the applications, but we have some terrific. We have original applications for many, many, many posts. 
And basically what that is, it will look something like this. And it'll Okay, provide. well, we have to do our um, final step. Sorry, okay. guys. I just okay. looked at the time. Oh, yeah. All and right. uh, final step is to join the sons or the daughters. And let's go through these steps really quick for garnering GAR ancestors. You want to identify the Civil War veteran. You want to do genealogical research. Then you want to contact the GAR or use that website. Use then the step website. four is to search the records. Step five is to research the encampment books. And then step six is to join the GAR. Yes. All right, guys. You are a direct descendant. For yes. a direct descendant. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for being here, Walt, Thank Jim, you, and so Michael. Well. Have so a well. great, fantastic day. Thank you. Take care.